Did you know that there are over 3.2 billion gamers around the world? Not only that, but the average gamer spends between $100 and $200 per year on gaming. It's safe to say that there is a lot of money moving around in the gaming industry, and some cryptocurrencies have been competing to get a slice of this massive pie. One of these is the Sandbox, whose Sand token went interstellar after Facebook announced its metaverse push at the end of October. Today, I'm going to give you a recap of what the Sandbox is, bring you up to speed on what the project has been up to, and tell you why Sand may become the biggest gaming cryptocurrency. I know you can't wait to begin, but going on without a disclaimer would be a sin. If you came here looking for financial advice, I'm afraid you're in the wrong place. There's only education and entertainment in this space. Contact a financial advisor before investing, just to be safe. If this is your first time making my acquaintance, my name is Guy and I teach crypto with patience. This is in contrast to the moon boys who shill and shout. Quality is what the Coin Bureau is all about. Topics like coins, tokens, news, and reviews. If you're interested in crypto, there's something here for you. If this is the kind of content you want, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell to make sure you get it while it's hot. If the grains of sand in your hourglass are running low, you can skip around using the timestamps down below. Just know that watching until the end will help your brain and the channel grow. OK, that's it for my intro remarks. Let's all go play in the sandbox. If the sandbox is new to you, here's what you need to know. The sandbox was founded way back in 2012 by Sebastian Bourget and Arthur Madrid. The sandbox was made by Pixel, a software company based in San Francisco. The Sandbox began as a 2D mobile game where users could build their own virtual worlds. The Sandbox managed to amass over 40 million users and is still available on mobile today as the Sandbox Evolution. Following the crypto bull market in 2017, Pixel announced its plans to turn the Sandbox into a 3D game built on Ethereum, where every in-game item that users create is a non-fungible token. In 2018, Pixel was acquired by Animoca Brands, a software company based in Hong Kong which focuses on digital entertainment, blockchain, and gamification. As part of this acquisition, Animoca Brands incorporated TSB Gaming Limited, a for-profit software company based in Malta which works on the crypto version of the Sandbox. The Sandbox's development is coordinated by the Sandbox Foundation and consists of over 100 people in 32 different countries. The Sandbox raised around $7 million across three SAND token sales in 2019 and 2020 and has raised millions more from various land sales since 2019. The Sandbox's virtual world consists of 166,000 plots of land. Land are ERC721 tokens on Ethereum, which is Ethereum's non-fungible token standard. And by the way, I've linked to some of my most recent videos on NFTs in the description, so Feel free to watch some of those after this if you want the whole MO. Anyways, these land tokens can be grouped into estates, which are owned by one person, or districts, which are owned by two or more people. As you can see, some of the land in the sandbox is owned by companies such as Binance, Gemini, CoinMarketCap, Atari, and even the South China Morning Post. Land can be customized using the VoxEdit software. VoxEdit is also used to create game assets which exist as NFTs on Ethereum. Land can also be monetized by being rented out or by featuring pay-to-play experiences such as quests, which can be created using the Sandbox Game Maker. Land and assets can be bought and sold on the Sandbox's own NFT marketplace, and all NFTs are priced in the Sand token. Now, Sand is an ERC20 on Ethereum, and it is the Sandbox's in-game currency. Sand and land give governance rights to their holders, and sand can even be staked for additional rewards. The sandbox is currently in closed beta, and a public alpha launch could happen by the end of the year. More on that in a moment. If you want to learn more about how the sandbox works, you can watch my previous video about the project using the link up there in the top right. It's been more than a year since I last covered the sandbox. A year? Wow, where has that time gone? 
And it's safe to say that a lot has happened since then. In October 2020, Socios purchased a sizable estate in the sandbox to create a virtual platform for its community to congregate on. Now, for those who don't know, Socios is the company behind Chili's, a crypto project that features fan tokens for famous football teams. In January this year, the Sandbox announced its first round of public land sales, which would take place in February with CoinMarketCap as sale partner. In March, the Sandbox announced that its February land sales had broken NFT sale records, with nearly $3 million raised. At the end of March, the Sandbox released the public beta version of its NFT marketplace. This has probably contributed to the Sandbox fourth place position by NFT trading volume, according to nonfungible.com. In June, the Sandbox upgraded the VoxEdit software to allow for the seamless creation of in game assets. This has probably contributed to the 15,000 assets that have been created by the Sandbox community so far. The Sandbox's ongoing incentive programs for content creators have certainly helped as well. At the end of June, the Sandbox announced a series of initiatives to reduce its carbon footprint by 99%. These include purchasing carbon credits, planting a lot of trees, and integrating with Polygon, Ethereum's leading Layer 2 scaling solution, which uses proof of stake. In July, the Sandbox announced that it had partnered with Skybound Entertainment, the company behind the Walking Dead comics and TV show, to bring zombies to the metaverse. As part of this partnership, The Walking Dead was given a nice big plot of land, and the Sandbox subsequently sold land NFTs in proximity to the community so that, quote, fans and gamers alike can be as close as ever to their beloved brand. In August, the Sandbox announced a partnership with an esports project called Big Fan to bring virtual football and other sports to the Sandbox's world. In September, the Sandbox bought a Bored Ape NFT for 740 ETH. That works out to around $3 million. The Sandbox happens to have an extensive collection of community-owned NFTs, which is worth more than $14 million. Snoop Dogg also planted his flag in the Sandbox with the creation of a virtual mansion and even sold 1,000 passes to his private virtual party. In October, Ubisoft announced that it was looking to increase its investments into blockchain games with a specific focus on Animoca brands. And recall that Animoca owns the Sandbox. Earlier this month, the Sandbox announced that it had raised a staggering $93 million in a funding round led by SoftBank. Now, for those unfamiliar, SoftBank is one of the biggest investment companies in the world, and it's the sixth largest publicly traded company in Japan. This news, combined with the hype around Facebook's rebrand to Meta, took the SAND token to new all-time highs. The same thing happened to Decentraland's MANA, and you can learn more about where MANA is headed by using the link in the top right. As you can see, SAND seems to be pretty overextended, but it's not crashing nearly as quickly as I expected. In fact, it looks like its uptrend is scheduled to continue. This is for a few reasons. First. NFTs. As I mentioned a few moments ago, NFTs from the Sandbox are some of the most traded of any NFT collection. Many of these purchases are being made in Sand, which creates demand. Second, the Sandbox is on the lower end of the top 100, meaning it has a relatively mid-sized market cap. This means it takes less money to push up the price of Sand relative to larger cryptos in the metaverse category, such as Axie Infinity's AXS. Third, SAND's tokenomics are robust. SAND has a maximum supply of 3 billion, its initial and current distribution is solid, and its vesting schedule is evenly spread out. Now that said, it's worth pointing out that we are approaching another vesting cliff that's set to begin in December. This will see another 300 million SAND unlocked and potentially sold on the open market. The last vesting cliff happened back in July, and it seems to have suppressed the price of sand around that time. This means we could see the same thing happen again come December the 1st. Now, even so, sand's technicals are looking good, and that's the fourth reason why it might continue moving to the upside. If my measurements are correct, we could see sand rally by 2x in the coming weeks, assuming the rest of the crypto market doesn't crash, of course. The likelihood of SAND's rise is high, though, and that's because of the fifth factor, the Sandbox Roadmap. 
As I mentioned earlier, the Sandbox has yet to open its virtual world to the public. According to the Sandbox roadmap, this should have happened in the first half of this year. This deadline was probably pushed back by the Sandbox's plans to launch on Polygon. This is scheduled to happen in the fourth quarter of 2021, which is basically now until the end of the year. The Sandbox roadmap notes that this integration will include DeFi staking and a redeployment of the Sandbox's NFT marketplace. Interestingly, the Sandbox roadmap simultaneously says that its metaverse world will be opened up on a gradual basis in early 2022, starting with users who have built, quote, high-quality experiences in the game. By mid-next year, the Sandbox is hoping to set up its Decentralized Autonomous Organization, or DAO, and a recent presentation by co-founder Sebastian Bourget suggests the architecture of the DAO is almost complete. By the end of next year, the Sandbox is hoping to bring its new and improved virtual world back to the mobile users that made this project possible. The Sandbox even wants to follow Minecraft's lead by bringing its virtual world to consoles like Xbox and PlayStation. By the end of 2023, the Sandbox aims to have 5,000 games available within its virtual world, and a few dozen of these future games have already received funding from the Sandbox Foundation. Now, the focus of these games will be play to earn, as it's a model that's proven itself to attract hundreds of thousands of users. Look no further than Axie Infinity for evidence of that. Though not noted in the roadmap, the Sandbox is also hoping to create a virtual economy, as per comments made by Sebastian. This means that there will be various in-game jobs where you can make real money, similarly to how there are currently real people spinning the roulette at certain casinos in Decentraland. This is not exactly what comes to mind when you think of a crypto job, but I reckon the prerequisites will be similar to a regular crypto job. Now, you can learn more about how to be the perfect crypto candidate for the crypto position of your dreams by clicking that link up there in the top right. Anyways, back in March, Sebastian mentioned another thing that caught my ear, and that's that 100% of SAN's supply will be held by the community in three to five years' time. This implies that the company, team, advisors, and foundation are all planning on selling their sand between now and then. This begs the question of what will happen to the sandbox when the last sand token is vested, and this brings me to the concerns I have about the project. Besides the surprisingly short vesting schedule of sand and the issues this could present for the project's longevity, the sandbox could have a hard time going live. This is because the hype has been building up for more than three years, and the sandbox now has a massive community that's waiting to explore its virtual world. Now, this is incredible, but it also creates a huge hurdle for developers who must make absolutely sure that both the Sandbox website and its Polygon smart contracts are ready to handle that kind of load. Now, my second concern relates to the first, and that's the centralization of the architecture that underlies the Sandbox. While the Sandbox does leverage both Ethereum and IPFS, the Sandbox white paper notes that the Sandbox world itself runs on a single server hosted on AWS. This presents a single point of failure. Conversely, Decentraland uses a network of community-run servers to host its virtual world, which means that there is no single point of failure. The trade-off, of course, is scalability. Decentraland can currently only host 100 people per server, whereas the Sandbox can probably handle much more due to the centralization of its virtual world. And speaking of centralization, the Sandbox Foundation still maintains complete control of the project. To be fair, this is how almost every cryptocurrency starts. The problem is that this degree of control means Sand is unlikely to be listed on Coinbase in its current form, at least not soon, and that's because it could be seen as similar to a security, i.e. a stock in a company. Given that most of the money in the crypto market comes from the United States, this means that sand might not go as high as it otherwise would during this bull market simply because it's out of reach to US investors. Now, my last concern is the same one I have with other metaverse cryptocurrencies, and that's the Financial Action Task Force's finalized crypto recommendations. 
As far as the fat F is concerned, in-game crypto economies like the ones we're likely to see in the sandbox must mandate KYC. If these kinds of regulations go through by June 2022 like they're supposed to, it would restrict the sandbox's potential for adoption and, by extension, the price action of sand. Now, if this is news to you, you must have missed my recent video about the FATF, and you can find that in the usual spot, folks. Top right. Believe it or not, but the Sandbox is a crypto project I've been keeping a close eye on. I'm a huge fan of NFTs, and I think there's a lot of potential in this niche of the crypto industry. As far as metaverse worlds go, the Sandbox seems to be second to none. But then again, this is hard to say for sure, because its metaverse world has yet to go live. It's clear that there's still a lot of work to be done before that happens. And the longer the delay, the higher the likelihood that a competitor will come and claim that space. Decentraland is the elephant in the room here, and I find it funny that the Sandbox's token architecture is almost exactly like Decentraland's. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and if Decentraland is legit enough to copy, then clearly it is a formidable foe. There is one big advantage that the Sandbox has over Decentraland, though, and that's experience. It's easy to forget that the team behind the Sandbox has decades of experience in the gaming industry. When I listened to interviews with Sebastian Bourget and Arthur Madrid while researching this video, I was honestly amazed at just how aware they are of what they need to do to drive adoption. They're hyper-focused on advertising and partnerships both inside and outside of cryptocurrency. I reckon that's how they onboarded their 40 million users and it's how they'll get their next 40 million. The massive amount of funding the Sandbox recently received will certainly help with these initiatives and the attention the project has received from legacy gaming companies like Ubisoft only adds to the project's legitimacy. I do have my concerns, but I am confident they will be addressed in due time. No crypto project is perfect after all. All in all, I am very excited to see what the sandbox will look like the next time I cover the project, and I know almost for certain that sand will be at new all-time highs when I do. If you're a fan of sand, give that like button a slam. Be sure to smash the subscribe button too and ping that notification bell so you get a heads up when the next video hits the tube. If you're curious about what goes on behind the scenes, you can check out Coin Bureau clips for original flicks and interviews with other members of the Coin Bureau team. If social media is where you'll get your dopamine, follow me on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram for hot takes and memes. If you're having a hard time keeping up with the crypto market, joining my Telegram channel is an easy fix. I give you detailed daily updates about promising new cryptos, videos, and any news you might have missed. My weekly newsletter is the real deal, though. It's packed with the tools, tips, and tricks you need to renovate your portfolio. You even get to see the cryptos I hold, and I even let you know which ones I'm buying and which ones I've sold. The only thing better is a beanie, tee, or sweater from the Coin Bureau merch store. You can find it and my other resources using the links down below. As always, thank you for watching, folks, and I'll see you all in due course. Until then, have a nice day, a great afternoon, or a wild night. Goodbye.